Hello, welcome back to History of Wine and the Vine. I'm Emily Kate. Today's topic is ancient Egyptian wine. We'll talk about who was drinking it and when, how it was made, and how we know everything that we know about it. Then we'll finish up with a tasting. So who was drinking wine in ancient Egypt and when? Well, not a lot of people. Grape wine was incredibly expensive in ancient Egypt, and for that reason, it just wasn't popular. There were other alcoholic beverages like beer or date wine that most people drank, but in general, wine was kept for the top level of society who could afford it. They displayed their wealth in the court by having great big wine cellars. But for most people, wine was really only available for festivals or for funerary equipment or for religious offerings. They also used it a bit for medicine. It was used in a mixture to try to help asthma, to lower someone's fever, or to induce labor. But in general, beer was the drink of choice. So how did they make this wine? Well, all wine starts in the vineyard. Here are some hieroglyphics for vine and vineyard. Now, as you can see, they all show a kind of system to get the vine off the ground. This is a trellis system or a pergola system, is what we call it these days, and it's just to remove the grapes from the ground and to put them higher up. So as you can see through analysis of these, that this would be where the grapes were and they would have set up stakes or some kind of wood plank that the vine can wind its way around in order to stay off the ground. If you're interested in these hieroglyphics, here are some hieroglyphics for grape cluster. Now this one seems to be the most obvious one that I would think of because it seems to have the grape, the skin, perhaps the pulp and the seeds and makes a lot of sense. These I'm not so sure about. Now what would happen is they would bring the grapes from the vineyard in with big baskets and they would put them on the treading floor. Now, the treading floor was where a bunch of people would step on them, tread on the grapes to get the juice out. So at first this treading floor was a long, flat area and they would step on the grapes there. But as it evolved and as they made more and more wine, they began to have kind of more of a basin than a flat area and this enabled them to put more and more grapes in. Now, stepping on grapes, not so safe. Um, they decided to make this kind of contraption that would go over where they would hang ropes down so that people could actually hold on to the ropes to steady themselves as they stepped on the grapes so that they wouldn't fall. Um, once the grapes were stepped on, uh, what they would do is they would take the must, which is the stepped on grapes. They would, um, this is the grapes minus the juice. So if the juice was taken out, the remaining pulps, uh, seeds, um, pips and skins, this is the must. So the must would actually go into a big sack and there were two ways that they evolved to use this sack in order to get the must to squeeze a little bit more and get a little bit of juice out. So here I have this book to show you. The book is called Wine and Wine Offering in the Religion of Ancient Egypt. And if you can see, this is the first way that they got out the must. So this is the sack, and I'll put this down to explain. So they had the must in the sack. Then they had two sticks essentially attached to the sides of the stacks and they would twist it around and then pull it really tight just to make sure that they got all of the juice out. Now this is fairly labor intensive so later on they came up with something else to do. This is as depicted in the wall paintings of Beni Hassan. So here you can see it's a similar thing. You still have the sack right here um, and you still have the juice coming out, but instead of using five people, you're using three or four and it seems a lot easier on them. So what you're doing is you're essentially keeping this steady. You have the sack connected, then you have these guys and there's now one stick instead of two. And this one stick is being turned around an axis in order to crush, crush, crush the grapes even more and to get this is the juice flowing out. 
and then it all goes into this basin. Now, we don't actually know what they did with that juice. We don't know if it was mixed in with the first press juice, the juice that they stepped on, um, or we don't know if it was used for something else. But these are, this is the evolutionary process of their wine press. So if you're interested, here are the hieroglyphs, hieroglyphics for um, vintage and pressing. So what I find interesting about this is, over at Vintage, you can see that there's a depiction of three different birds. Now, even nowadays, birds are pests in vineyards. So you might think, oh, because they eat the grapes, how many grapes can they eat? It's actually not about them eating the grapes. What they do is, so you have a grape has um, skin. And inside the skin is the pulp and the seeds, like we've talked about. And what happens is, if a bird comes and pecks at the skin of any grape, if it breaks the skin, then that makes the grape a lot more susceptible to mold and rot and all kinds of things you do not want around your grapes. So even if the bird doesn't eat the grapes and you lose the grapes, you can still lose the grapes and the surrounding grapes if rot is encouraged. So I just find it interesting that that was clearly a concern of theirs during the vintage time. Um, and then the grapes would move to be uh, fermented and to turn into wine. And we do know that most of the wine that the ancient Egyptians drank and offered was actually red wine. And what that means is that it was fermented with the must, with the skins. So the way that red wine gets its color and tannin is that it's in with the skin. So the skin has time to impart the color and the flavor and the tannin into the must. For instance, if you were to remove the skins before fermentation, you would end up with white wine or depending on how long you kept them, uh, kept the skins in contact with the pulp, you might get um, a rosé wine. So those are uh, the things that we know about how they made wine in ancient Egypt. So how do we know all of this about ancient Egyptian wine? Well, there are two main factors. One, there were depictions on the insides of tombs, mostly royal tombs, that indicate to us a lot about the process of making the wine. Like, for instance, that's how we know about the sack press with the two sticks that was pulled to get the juice out. Um, and we also, from the tombs, know about offerings. So earlier I mentioned that one of the um, uses for wine in ancient Egypt was a uh, religious offering. Now what you see in the tombs is actually a lot of depictions like this. So I have these to demonstrate. They were just on the table. I think they're for candles. Um, they would actually hold up two globular pots that they call NW pots. And they would hold them up to the side and the deity would be over there. And they would hold them up to the deity while kneeling. And this was a sign of respect. And it was a way that they could try to guarantee a blessed afterlife and um, a successful life on earth. So in that way, we know about um, the offering of the wine as well as knowing about uh, the production of the wine. Now, interestingly enough, there's also um, depiction of who was picking the grapes and who was making the wine. And it turns out that these were sometimes not actually Egyptians. They had um, Nubian or Asiatic peoples uh, who would be tending the vineyard crops. And actually in some points there are um, quotes from people that say that it's a prisoner of war that was making their wine. So a lot of different things come out through these tomb paintings. And another source of the information about wine that we have is excavated cellars. So you might find a huge store of jars um, underground and through the analysis of that is pretty interesting because they actually put a lot of information on their jars. So whereas we have wine bottles today, they didn't have bottles back then, but they had jars. And they would include a lot of the same information that we actually include on our bottles. So it might state the vintage, what year it was made. Um, it could state the, um, the style of the wine, sweet or dry. Um, it could also state 
the domain where the grapes were grown as well as the winemaker and any other information that they thought might be important. So I find that to be a pretty interesting aspect because to my knowledge that's a pretty advanced thing to be doing with your wine in ancient Egypt, um, to be giving such a clear indication of the history of the wine and where it was coming from, who was making it, so I'm pretty impressed by that. Now this week for the tasting, it was a little bit difficult to decide what to do because the ancient Egyptians, as you know, not everybody drank the wine, and when they did, it was a very special occasion, so they didn't actually like to adulterate the wine, as they called it. Um, they drank yayin, was what they called the uh, pure, unadulterated wine, so there's not really that many recipes to choose from like there is with ancient Greece or ancient Rome, where they were putting all kinds of stuff in. Um, but there is a recipe that I read about uh, that is much like last week's um, mulsum, which if you remember was like mead. It was wine and honey. So this week's is like that, but it also has pepper. So I've never tried anything like this before. It's a type of spiced wine. So for our tasting this week, that's what we'll make. Okay, so now for the tasting. Now, this recipe could have used pepper and could have included frankincense and myrrh, which are two different spices. I'm going to simply use honey and pepper today. So for the wine, we have the same wine we used last time, which is this lovely Italian wine. Um, let's see if you can see that. And this was, um, we got this one at Gotham Wines in New York City. And here we go. I'll let you guys see everything that I do. So I'm just putting in the wine. Just a little bit more. Putting in the wine. Then I'm going to use some honey in it. So just my bear of honey. And at this point, it's pretty much the same as the mulsum or the mead that we made last time. So we'll get a good amount of honey in there and mix that in good and now for the pepper so I have this um, pepper shaker thing and I'm just going to grind pepper into the wine I've never had spiced wine before so this is definitely new now we'll stir it up a bit kind of floats on the top. I don't know if you guys will be able to see that. So we've now got this um, pepper honey wine that I'm about to taste. <laughs> the pepper is really strong. Um, so we'll just do a regular tasting. So you look at the wine and you should look at it with a white background ever useful index cards. Um, this is a dark ruby wine and swirl it around the glass just to open it up a bit in terms of the nose. So that, that helped. If you're making this at home, which I suggest that you do just to try it, um, definitely give it a little bit of time to mix. I found that also last week with just the honey that when I let it sit for a little bit um, that it really it became much more as one rather than just having honey and wine in the same glass it kind of became its own drink. So mix that around a bit and that actually smells really good. I definitely suggest that you make this. Um, Smells a lot the same like last week, but interestingly enough, whereas I found last week that this was a very fruit forward kind of um, wine, in a lot of red wines you can get this spicy um, tobacco or peppery black pepper flavor um, or smell and it's kind of artificially putting it into this wine, which I didn't feel really had that last week, so it's kind of cool to see the difference. And I guess now it's time for the tasting.
I'm really glad it has the honey in it as well. <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't try it with just pepper. Um, it's actually pretty good. I don't know if I would have it with a meal like they did. I'm not sure if I would um, drink it with a meal, but as its own beverage, as its own mixed drink, so to speak, it's actually pretty tasty. Because like I said, there are wines out there, there are red wines, lots of red wines, great red wines, that have um, a black pepper flavor. So putting this in is not that crazy, even though it seemed like it at first. It complements the fruit in an interesting way, whereas I was getting a lot of um, dark red fruits. Now it's kind of more almost tasting like black fruits a little bit, maybe blackberries and um, like really dark plum and uh, black cherry as opposed to red cherry. So it's interesting how that kind of changed with the addition of the pepper. Um, so. I suggest that you do this yourself as well at home and if you do please let me know in the comments I would love to hear um, and until next week cheers <laughs>